Oui, ça me rejette. C'est ça. Mais c'est simplement, sinon, les, les contributions individuelles sont bien, quoi. Euh, J'ai l'impression que le, leur problème, c'était aussi qu'ils pensaient peut-être qu'un livre, livre comme « Au rôle 3 des champs de la history » peut quelque part, inconsciemment et involontairement, peut-être avoir l'air un peu d'un carcan, comme un, un manuel qui, qui se... Et eux, je pense qu'ils avaient dans l'idée, oui, mais bon, « Au rôle history », c'est bien plus que ça, et ta, 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 ta. Bon, en vrai. Bon, alors, commençons. Non, la chose... Bon... <rire> On, on y vient, on y vient. On y vient. Parce qu'il y a des critiques à faire ici. J'en ai, j'en ai euh, même oui, oui, oui. de trop. Mais on fait. D'accord. Euh, et on parlera de ça. Uh, so, Yann, let's uh, continue in English. We were just talking about. Uh, we were just uh, talking about. Uh, a re fairly recent book by Louise White and David Cohen on uh, uh, African Voices uh, to parallel that with your book on a whole tradition as history. And you were just finishing a sentence saying that you yourself have a lot of criticism and critique about your own book, even too, too many. But um, maybe before we go to that, uh, can we, we, we actually uh, we, uh, had a longer interview a couple of days ago, and unfortunately the camera didn't, uh, didn't uh, record. Um, Can you just summarize uh, the, the history of how this book came into being, uh, the first version, then what happened in the 1970s, the loss of copyrights, and then the 1985? Well, to be brief, mm -hmm. um, you know, the original oral tradition began to, uh, to suscitate a lot of critique starting in the 1970s, starting with anthropologists uh, like Tom Beidelman, who's still cited for this, and then by disappointed historians, among whom you have to count William Cohen, mm. who tried a very positive uh, approach to this at with Roland Oliver in, in London. Mm. And then... Um, so you mean applying some early tools to look at African oral tradition uh, and try yes. to, to he, make something he, out of it. He tried first by using uh, the original oral mm -hmm. tradition and by using what Oliver had developed as parallel chronologies for parallel dynasties. He started by, by creating a um, chronological framework for the 19th century uh, about the Great Lakes area. And In doing so, uh, he then wrote a book on a group in Uganda mm -hmm. uh, and its history, and it did not come out. And he, he did not. He realized something wasn't right. And but he. But but, but just a, just a sec. Um, you're talking about using oral tradition as a historical source. Yes. Right. Uh, so this as was a debate, the history. disappointments were, were about... Well, his disappointment was mm -hmm. that he had expected um, to get more time depth mm -hmm. than he had, uh, a clearer line of ancestry to the traditions than the ones he had, and these did not happen. But then, on, a, on the next field work, and I mentioned Cohen especially because he's the driving force behind... Uh, the later developments, he, at uh, least in the U.S. Did he study at Madison? He did not study here. Oh. I think he studied at uh, at uh, School of Oriental Studies oh, okay, in, okay. in yeah. London. Yeah, okay. That's, I think, where he was trained. Well, uh, in any case, to come back, the, so the oral tradition was embattled and all sorts of things were written about it, mostly critique, some of which was good and some of which was bad, but I reacted to none of it because uh, I also had lost control, I had no control over oral tradition, uh, especially the English version of it, yeah, because the, tr the translators... You mean the book. So the book, the book, you first wrote it when you were in the military and, in Belgium. Right, Congo. and so I could 1960. not... I could not use a re-edition of the book or rearrangement. And in any case, over time, it became clear that a re-edition was not a solution. It would not do. So you, you felt so I wrote you, you got too many feedback 
too many criticism on the Virgin in France. Well, not only that. And you that, were not happy. But there was also mine, you know, yes, yes. Uh, developing over time. The main critique of the original oral tradition is very simple. I mean, there are two of them. Uh, it is that it was a work by a young academic which was copied after, it's not a, 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 a copy, but it's its uh, model mm -hmm. was the, tra the traditional rules of evidence, mm -hmm. uh, the traditional historical method. And its aim was to show, in fact, that all traditions could be handled just like any written sources. Mm -hmm. So um, that, and that would not do. That was that, too, that's narrow, a basic flaw. too narrow, too uh, uh, it is, constraining. It is to thinking of oral tradition as a variety of text, uh -huh. written text. And it is not because oral tradition is linked to performance. Right. And, so um, we talked about that last right. time. So, so we so talked then, about that. Talking a lot with uh, Harold Scheub mm. here, you, you came to realize that oral tradition have a, an element that you'd never looked at, no, did not really look at it well, the first I, version. I, I knew the element, but I just hadn't put it in. Yeah, so um, performing message, or right. tradition, Shona's message. And then, uh, so it, when the press here suggested that I, I, I do something to change this, um, I, um, you know, I used the year that I had, well, six months more than a year in Germany to write to rewrite it completely. Mm -hmm. And I had at hand there a library, that um, anthropological library, where, um, all where historical anthropology was represented for all over the world, so that helped. That was in Frankfurt. That was in Frankfurt, and I was uh, working there with Beatrix Heinze, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and somebody who belonged to the cultural school mm -hmm. of anthropology, in Germany, a uh, student of, um, boy, the well, name's cool. Yeah, but in uh, any it, case, he was head of, with the head of uh, Eike Haberland, this is his name, Haberland. Can he was the head of the, of the studies. Can I stop you just a second? Yes. Uh, because I know, I mean, you write in many of your articles uh, about your very close mm -hmm. collaboration with Beatrice Heinz. Yes. Beatrix Heinz. And I'd like to know more, I mean, uh, how did you meet her? How did you collaborate? Why is she important in your was she, or she still well, important you see, in your uh, in your um, work? Beatrix is much younger than I am, mm -hmm. and when I when I returned from the Congo the first time in I think 1957 or was it 1958 59, she'd read some of my articles, mm -hmm. and, and she, she was a she was a, she was a student at Munich a student in anthropology at the ah. time, at Munich, but in historical anthropology, which was, um, um, you know, under, well, what's well, his name? In any we, case, we can find out later. Well, the, the only historical anthropologist left in Germany at mm -hmm. the time. Um, you know, there were lots in Austria, but not in Germany. Mm -hmm. In any case, she had also studied French, mm -hmm. seriously, and uh, so she had done Romance Languages and Anthropology, and she's had some training in history, but and, and she, quite good training she in history. She also reads Portuguese, doesn't she? Well, she learned Portuguese mm -hmm. because of um, one of her earliest research things. So at the time we met, she had done all of that. She had been appointed, or she was being appointed, to, to uh, as a secretary to run a journal uh, <laughs> at the Frankfurt Institute. And from there, she became practically managing editor of the, the journalist called Paiderma. I see. It's, you know, it's for instance, for uh, people may not know this, but it's one of the earliest journals that insisted on the importance of life histories and unearthed a, life, a, a book length life history from 1938, which was an autobiography of someone in Malawi. And life histories in general for historians or life histories in Africa? Uh, no, life, life histories in general. In general, yeah. But Paidoma, Paidoma under uh, her direction and, and Eike Hamberland's direction became practically an African history journal. Mm -hmm. There was very little else. So she never, yeah. had, a, she never had an academic uh, position? She never... No. 
Huh. She never, you know, academic positions were at that time were Germany. very <laughs> rare, especially in Germany. Yeah. This is Germany after the war anyway. Right. So in any case, she also, as, as editor of Pike Neumann, she also published over a hundred volumes in um, anthropology and in history, you know, together again with Ike Haveland, they it's like edit, being editor, editor of a university press. So so you met her in where in... No, I never met her at that time. Okay. Um, so you were corresponding. We, we, she came to Tervu when I was not there. I mean, I was in Africa. Mm. So we then started, this started the correspondence. And I, I met her years afterwards. And the year we're talking about that I was rewriting this, um, that's when I first saw her for longer than an hour or two. Um, at at uh, Frankfurt. Oh really? So that was like. But well, there was we had a lot of twenty-five years later, right? We had a lot of correspondence, mm -hmm. and you see, she was interested uh, because at that time, anthropologists in Germany had all become sociological. They hmm. all gone sociology, the Frankfurt School of Sociology. They and were all not that. interested in any well, historical anthropology. You see, the, the pre-war historical anthropology in Germany and was too much tainted with, with um, Nazism mm. and so it was in Sweden by the way as well. So that explains mm. why a few people apart where um, you know that it, it completely fell out. Mm. Now the one exception was the, the teacher of uh, you know, the teacher of Beatrix his name is uh, Hans Baumann I know I remember. This Baumann was uh, was briefly, I think he was actually a Nazi supporter in 38 to 40. Yeah, because I see his book on Miss Der Afrikanischen Volker, 1936. But, yeah, that was not, you see, it's, it's really weird to be a Nazi supporter, <laughs> but to be for the rights of autochthonous people anywhere. <laughs> well, so he was a mixed person, but let's focus a little bit more. So. This is how we, we corresponded, mm -hmm. and she became an historian, just working, you know? mm -hmm. uh, and she she learned Portuguese like she had learned Romance languages, French in, in particular. She's extremely thorough, and then she found this big trove of family from family manuscripts from 1621 to 1629 in Portugal, from a family of somebody who had been the, the governor of, of Angola, and she edited them, it's two, two big volumes, 400 in, pages uh, each. In German or in Portuguese? She edited them in Portuguese. Ah. Um, and and she, is there a translation? No, it's just in Portuguese. I, I don't think there is a, there is, no, okay. I don't think there is a translation. Mm -hmm. In any case, and then, so she devoted part of her career first to the 17th century, and then she went over to German travelers in the late 19th century, and what kind of people they were, mm -hmm. because of course there were also plenty of sources that she found. Um, and that renovated the history of um, exploration, mm -hmm. not just in, in, um, in Portuguese Africa, but basically because she found so many records about the African people who led or organized or advised these, these um, expeditions, yeah. that she was able to write a whole book about them. And you know uh, Johannes Fabian's uh, book called yes. Out of Our Minds? Yes, and exactly. Fabian uses some of the same sources. Mm -hmm. uh, but but he's preci much precisely also to talk a lot about the African mm -hmm. experts. In those but he Caribbean. got that from her. Uh -huh. And that's not the only. So he got that from, from her. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, he's a high level professor in Amsterdam. So, um, and his book was more sensational. Mm -hmm. she, she tends not to be sensational, but she does mention, you know, in a very sort of dry way that, yes, um, from this month's expedition in Kassai, we're smoking hashish all the time <laughs> because local people right. were. And of course, this is something where Fabian really goes all Yeah, he writes a whole book about it. Right, he writes a whole book about it. <laughs> So or at least makes it the driving engine of uh, knowledge, right. <laughs> acquiring knowledge. In some... so, so, but she, she worked mostly on Central Africa. She worked exclusively on Angola. And she worked all her life on Angola. Okay. Um, so that's 
why if you are in that specialty you know her very well you know right, about right. her very well right. but otherwise you may not even have heard of her okay. much so sorry we, we were uh, again uh, kind we of wandering around right. but, um, so 1990, 1995, 1985 you have I a completely rewritten version right. and this was not just a small revision uh, the first two chapters are brand new mm -hmm. and also in conception they are so not the first chapter is messages the generation of messages yes where messages come from mm -hmm. and then um, and the how one. you know how they are performed yes how, how they're kept in mind and how they are performed that's the second chapter so that's brand new that's chapter one and two and three uh, chapter one and two and getting the message is more about the audience or also the historian yeah getting the message comes if, if as an historian you may recognize that right. it, con it conforms to what historians call internal critique mm -hmm. uh, but then that is developed in chapter four which mm -hmm. deals with the message as social product you know i handle this quite theoretically i mean what you should consider right i did and this comes to one of the main critiques I now have of the book. You see, in all my footnotes, I refer to very concrete cases. Mm, but but clearly, don't... people do not read the footnotes. Yes. So, but you have examples for yeah, everything I that have you say. short examples. Yeah. But you see, for something like this, if I had given long examples, one of my examples, it, it would have been clear mm. to people like Cohen uh, and company who wrote the African Voices that... It's part of, you know, of historical critique to look at the social embeddedness mm -hmm. of tradition. And so that a lot of the points which they, they, they think I missed, they are there, but they are not. They are in footnote. They are not well, there. yes and no, because you have uh, chapter four, the message is a social right. product. But they overlooked it. And chapter five. The message as culture. Where you see the message as culture. Uh, for the instance. World views. Yes. There, there is a world view. Image and cliches. I mentioned space, time, mm. truth. You know, space, time, and truth, which are capital. Right. And again, uh, I'm in a, you know, I sort of say that you should consider that when you evaluate a, a, a tradition, what the, what the notion of truth is and the notion of time and of space. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the readers of, of this book, the editors of this book, did not read it. Mm -hmm. So they had, um, they they come, you know, they discuss historical truth, uh, but they distinguish between truth and authority, or um, and that in fact is not probably is probably not a very valid distinction. It's compare talking about apples and oranges at the same time. Uh, yes, the being a so genuine authority is important but it, it has nothing to do with the truth or non-truth mm -hmm. of something. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we, we, we'll go to, to yeah. this uh, a little bit later, but that's minute. an important point. Right. So, so then you okay. see the most original part of this new book is a chapter about the, how information is remembered. Mm -hmm. And first, how it is kept in mind. Mm -hmm. Now it's kept in mind, we did not know that at the time, but now we know that there is a physical link that is built up for every memory that people make, create. And this can decay or it can strengthen. You and it's a physical in, link in your brain. brain. Mm -hmm. You can see it on photos. Um, so it, it is really something hard. Now all these links are interconnected. And so the, your, your corpus of information in your head is not independent. It connects with all the other information. And this we know now directly, but at the time of the book, it was evident only from comparing traditions. And that, in mm. fact, different traditions, but remembered by the same person, tended to be arranged so that the person would remember them more easily. Uh, they tended to be built into a, a logical order and they tended to have a reference system, like you have a reference system in so the So that you can, you can, when you're aware of that, you can look at those oral traditions and see how they have been reworked to follow this yes. kind of... Yes, uh, and how, how, you see, you also see what is forgotten mm -hmm. 
mm. which part is forgotten and why in comparison to the economy of everything we have to remember. Right. Um, so that, that's so that, it, that that's would in be there. probably a couple of additional chapters you would put now with a new yes. new knowledge about how with new already. knowledge you could strengthen and this and And it's both individual and collective memory that there's new findings. No, a lot of collective memories is an, is uh, an item that I do not discuss in detail. Here. I mention it, you know, mm -hmm. but I don't discuss it in detail. Uh, I did work it out in more detail in um, a chapter in a, a sort of an article on Cuba collective memory, how it began. See, the problem with collective memory is, on the one hand. It is a sociological phenomenon. It is something that sociologists know mm. happens uh, to bring people together mm. or in situations where people are forced together mm. and they, they adjust their memories. Um, but it can also be shown, and that's what the Cuba case did, that you don't need a crisis situation. You can have collective memory in ordinary situations when you get a milieu in which that is interested in the oral tradition and that transmits them. Within that milieu, different people who know each other and are knowledgeable will adjust and get to a collective memory. Uh, you even get that in family history. Mm -hmm. You know, my sibling remembers this, I remember that. Um, we put our memories together, well first we add each their, their own part and then we, we agree on what we remember. Mm -hmm. So it's and a negotiating it's, kind of And it's process. a negotiated item. So by doing that, we obtain a common, a, a common talk, and that is collective memory. So collective memory has complicated origins in mm -hmm. each case, and that's, that's its, basic, its basic feature. Can you so talk to, it? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. To end with this book, uh, you know, after this, there are questions of chronology, Mm. And there is some assessment as to how to handle oral tradition with regard to other sources. These I have developed since, again in a set of articles. Right. But um, what about there's something that strikes me now? It's not you know a negative comment or anything, but you it could have been interesting perhaps uh, to look at the ways in which. Some, if you had, for instance, uh, a, a version of an oral tradition that you collected orally mm -hmm. and a written version, to see what are the mechanisms that transform, the very transcription transforms. Well, that, I didn't use, you see, I didn't use enough examples, but that's mm -hmm. there. Yeah, is it? I, okay. Oh, it is there. You see, it, it has to do with the technique of interviewing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, good interviews, I mean, if you have the time and you can afford it, good interviews are repeated interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, people who wrote something, recorded, let's say, a tradition in 1925, if you need them, if you meet them later on, of course you are going to have to record the new version. You right. are then comparing them right. uh, and so on and so forth. So that, that's all fairly standard stuff. No, um, so that's the book. Um, Now what we so can we do talk... with it... Excuse me. You see, what we can do with it is, we can first ask why, what's unique about our tradition that's still there, and as a source is fairly well discussed, but it's inside information. And this, I, in my view, is absolutely, it's very important right. that to have inside information. Now it happens that in this book, I'll, uh, I'll just show it to, uh, to the camera. Yeah. So it's the African Words, African Voices, edited by Louise White, Stephen Misher, and Cohen. David Cohen in 2001. 2005, I think. One. 2001, you were right. Yeah, 2001. <laughs> okay, well, you see in that book, um, they... they So uh, let Thomas. me just uh, introduce the book as mm -hmm. I saw it yeah, come out. It, it was a, a fairly uh, seminal book because it, you know, it, it, it was. I don't think there's any other book uh, that came after oral tradition mm -hmm. as history. 
uh, that had so much impact in the field. You know, it was like, you know, what can we say today about oral history, oral tradition, oral sources, and making, you know, writing African history. So, so in this sense, I think it's a, it's a good. Uh, are you looking for your notes? I no, think I they agree. are. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it was an important book, and and it's a book that I've, I actually haven't re, re looked at, looked again at the uh, introduction, but they they do take you as a as a kind of they they address all tradition as history. Well, your book. You see, essentially, it's. It's a book that deals with recent oral traditions, with right. recent hist oral history. Mm -hmm. um, and its starting point is different. It does not ask what is, how true or how reliable oral traditions or oral history are. They deal with the context of oral history. Right. That is how it fits in a society and in a culture, how it's remembered, how it's, it's talked about. Uh, and that, of course, is quite valid. I mean, it is one of the things one should do. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it, the book has, is, has quite a number of drawbacks. Uh, the thing that, that you know, strikes me the most mm. is that it is a typical example of what you might call a chapel organization. That is... C'est une chapelle. It's mm -hmm. a, a number of scholars who know each other, who are introduced to the body of, of knowing each other. And you can see it in the accounts of, of how they chose, the, how they got the people to the conferences mm -hmm. that out of which they grew. Uh, but that has limitations. Right. And the, the thing that strikes is, first, that they only cite sources in English if they are French, there are a few French ones, four or five, I think, they can't come from translations. You know, citations like, say, Foucault in translation. Um, the French authors in translation, uh, among them is Griot's Ogotameli, mm. is an example of, they say, knowledge, African knowledge, that has been neglected and forgotten. Mm. They have not realized, by the way, that Rouge, the other example this side, was extremely critical of Gotham mm -hmm. and that in fact it has been shown in several articles, a famous one amongst about the star Sirius, mm -hmm. that this could not be yeah, observed. Yes, there have been a lot of uh, things on the whole so, history. And you see, but that's an example of things they don't know because they were published in French mm -hmm. um, or in journals they don't read. So. The limitations in English are quite serious. Mm -hmm. There is no real comparative evidence where there could be. There, there, section 2 deals with life histories. And all the individual chapters are quite interesting. Right. But in the introduction, they do not say, no, there is quite a literature about biography. There is quite a lit another literature about autobiography. There is a literature about eyewitness account. You know, and you get this in courtrooms and there are disputes and discussions and in these and these. There's nothing of all that. Mm -hmm. It is So it doesn't give justice to the, the wealth of life stories from Africa and, and the scholarship. That right. has also looked they, at they limit that. I was thinking of uh, Bogumin Jusiviki, mm -hmm. who has done a lot in recovering and... He writes in French. African and so, life stories, but, but those look, are amazing. I mean, if you look, if you look in the introduction at life stories, mm -hmm. you know you'll see that they begin. They say, well, they began in the years eighties, seventies, eighties, and nineties with feminist historiography. That's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, it began much earlier in anthropology. That's true. They use, they cite some of the older anthropology, mm -hmm. but just only a few texts, classical texts from the nineteen twenties and thirties. But they do not cite the anthropological critique of this form of anthropology in the 1940s, 50s, and the, the you know, the, the seminal books on these are Mexican autobiographies that were, were used, that have been used in, in the United States and worked on very much. Mm -hmm. There's, no, they don't even cite that. Mm -hmm. So what you have is a limited group of scholars citing each other or citing 
persons they admire, you know, from previous, and not really being thorough, at least not in the introduction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a problem. So then finally, no, that's not finally. I think um, one point that they talk about <coughs> is that they, they say that <coughs> your approach tended to try and distinguish and perhaps create mm. a false kind of boundary between African-African tradition mm. and those that were embedded in colonial, uh, kind of colonial, you know, mutual kind of influence, mm -hmm. and also that you create a false distinction. Uh, again, not, not necessarily positively, explicitly, but, you know, the result of your book is that you also might create a false distinction between what is written and what is oral. I think they look at, at, at oral sources yeah, in know. a more, perhaps, uh, way. hybrid way or complicated way. No, you see, way. this means that they have not read either my first book, which was far too close to written, to, and nor the second one. Mm -hmm. and, and this one, I took a, a, a certain distance in this a certain distance from written texts and oral because I had confused them too much in the first one over issues of performance, as I mentioned. Um, but essentially, the you see, where I see that they tend to be really confused, and again, I'm talking only about the introduction, is in not seeing that their goals are not the goals that, I, you know, that, that we are talking about. As historians, we use sources and we try to see that the sources are valid or valuable, and that's why we have historical method. But you can also ask of the same, of the same performances or the same written text or whatever you have, you can also ask different questions. Mm -hmm. And the question that they ask is what do they represent in in their social embedded, embeddedness. Mm -hmm. now, what are they promoting? What are their political positions? And so on, which are, which they, or their cultural positions, which they, they work on. And so that the, so that is perfectly valid. Mm -hmm. But you can, you see, you, you have two different set of yeah. questions. Your and agenda you have was different. Two different your, set of answers. Your, your agenda was more to try to look at those oral traditions no. to see whether you could find, you could recover something that happened in right. the past. You know, my, but, but, including no, but including the, a, a very long durée change in, in mentality, in, right. in, in worldviews. It's that, not just topical events. Yes, you see, but that's, that's really right. Huh? But you see, they, they do get confused between mm -hmm. method on the one hand and goals on the other. Mm -hmm. So that when you, as explicitly in this book, when White says, well, we should not worry about authenticity, we should not worry about the, the, the validity of traditions or, and so on and so forth, we should worry about their authenticity. Um, she's, she's beginning to say that historians should not bother about the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, by that, by the, at that point, something is clearly not right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that's the last difficulty I found with them. Mm -hmm. um, I found, you know, also specifically, and I mentioned it in passing, that they're extremely weak on historiography. Some of it is not right. And, uh, like what? Well, for instance, um, there's when they talk about the historiography in Africa this time of uh, the period of the 50s and 60s, they simply don't know it. Mm -hmm. you know, they say that colonial, and colonialism rejected any or had no uses at all for history. And they clearly quote from English-speaking territories. When you talk about West Africa and you remember De La Force and the whole train of administrators after him, that until independence, it's clear that for West African colonial administration, this history was quite important. And you can show also in other territories that historians and the administrators were extremely interested in local histories 
when it came to the distribution of power and the setting up of chieftaincies. Mm -hmm. But that's a kind, you know, they, they somehow they missed all of that. Mm -hmm. um, they mention, and they do mention rightly, the African authors from the 1920s onwards that were published. Um, you know, people like Johnson, they, of course, don't not reading French means they don't know about Madagascar, where they have a whole historiography. They don't read Arabic, so they don't know about Ghana, where they have 17th century, 18th century, 19th century examples showing that all through, wherever there was a possibility of having writing, the writing, you know, was applied to record local histories and the, the authors were, of course, Africans. So, you see, it, that's what I mean by def defective historiography in part. So that's, but otherwise, I think, look, if you don't read the introduction and you, you use the essays in the book, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. So we interrupt for a few minutes. I forgot to mention, with regard to the book, the, you know, African Voices book, that because they deal with recent, recent, re recent uh, history, that they are an ex that you know that they are a collection. The whole collection uh, is quite valid, but it does not represent all of oral tradition. And uh, since then, more recently, I've been able to to um, work some more on these problems, and it has become clear that physically speaking, you, the brain, the human brain, handles remembered items differently from knowledge items. 2 plus 2 is 4 does not undergo the same mental processes as remembering my grandfather's this or that. So th this is important because recent, recent histori no, histor historical sources stem for the most part not from knowledge but from remembering, from no, what, it, what is called episodic, episodic memory. And episodic memory is always laden with emotion. It's flooded with emotion, but not emotion necessarily from now, emotion from then as well mm -hmm. as now. It is, it is preserved along. Mm -hmm. Whereas knowledge either has it is no emotional connection, 2 plus 2 is 4, mm -hmm. for most people, <laughs> uh, or it acquires an emotional connection, but one that's linked exclusively to now. And in, you know, by, showing, by studying these differences, you can show that, that, that the handling of recent historical memory is uh, different from uh, remote historical memory. Recent historical memory, by the way, goes back, can go back to about 100 to 120 years, something like that. The remote one is, you know, in, in handles, deals about more and more times, mm -hmm. except that remote oral tradition, in fact, in the human mind, very probably it has survived only because it is remembered again. Mm -hmm. But each memory makes it different and brings it back into the uh, memorized. So is this, uh, this is the topic of your uh, most recent presentation at the yes. Sandwich Seminar. And I would develop Madison. that into a book. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Or I can tell in about three minutes. Yeah, go um, ahead. You see, what, what this book would deal with is, first it would explain the difference between recent and remote. So processing, uh, the ways in which this information is, is processed through... Where the information the comes from. And... Uh, then it would explain why remote uh, is remembered. Mm -hmm. And this would be a book that would handle long examples, uh, you know, not just footnote examples, long examples, mm -hmm. uh, because the most important use for remote oral tradition has to do with identities. Mm -hmm. And so it has to do with the creation of ethnicity or the maintenance of ethnicity. It has to do with the affiliation to religious identities and the like. And um, as, it, as you can imagine, there are magnificent examples of this all through world mm -hmm. history. Uh, and so that, that, you know, that will make it, it quite interesting. There are also remote, uh, remote memories that are not 
dealing with ethnicity and that are not that, that much concerned. But the ones that are, by the way, divided in two groups of sources, there are narratives, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, and there are epics. And of course, um, epics are not just in Africa, but they're, they're, uh, the epic is a genre, a literary genre, that's ideally suited for this. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you check it out, I think you'll find that there is no epic that does not deal with remote oral tradition. They are, it's a genre mm -hmm. that applies to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be it. The, then the other remote traditions that are not concerned with identities uh, and tend not to carry that heavy and emotional load uh, tend to be uh, more down to earth. Mm. Um, you know, that is, they tend to be the sort of things that you remember from in the recent ones, but a generation or two before, mm -hmm. and there you have to explain why it was remembered at all. Mm -hmm. So that, that, so, that so book, book to me them. would have a very different agenda than oral tradition as history. Uh, mm -hmm. To simplify oral tradition as history is to look at oral tradition and explain and try to give some method to use it as a right. historical source. And this new book and will do the same thing, but only for what we call myths. Yes, but it seems to me that it would do also, it would look more at the role of memory and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. memorialized events right. in creating social, political, cultural it identities. Would. It would. It would be more, perhaps, looking at those sources not only as messages for the historian, but as engine for for social yes. production. It would be. It would certainly do that, mm -hmm. um, and it would link. You see, the even in this book, even in the, the mission book, um, right. they they simply do not yet realize the importance of identity and the link between identity history and Narratives. Uh, narrative, yeah. or narrative or epic or whatever, yeah. um, or song, by right. the way. Although they talk about subjectivity, which is interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they reduce it also. It's important, you know, at the scale of the individual, which is kind of in interesting as well. No, you see, they, they, they talk about, they, they oppose subjectivity to authenticity. Mm. And uh, in fact, they do, not, they do not really oppose subjectivity to objectivity. Mm -hmm. They mention objectivity as something that was tried out. Mm -hmm. But they, again, they are too narrow. They did not realize there's a whole debate. And in general historiography, in history and theory, for instance, which they never cite, mm -hmm. that history and theory has a whole discussion precisely on this point that objectivity is impossible. Mm. So what are the goals of an historian? Are you going to try to be as subjective as possible, as some of them are? Or are you going to try to be as least subjective as possible? And you know, the, 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 the whole debate's about that. Right. Um, okay. What they mean by subjective is simply that they want the voice of they want, and this has to do with their notion of African voices. They want the goals of the African, the Africans who tell a tradition mm -hmm. or tell an event, or the, those goals to be untouched. And this you should, they should be reproduced and they should be respected above all other goals. I think you're exaggerating a bit. I think they want to show that <coughs> the subjectivity of the informant of the person mm -hmm. who tells the story is a very worthy research object for research. So it's interesting to Yes, of course it's an <laughs> of course it's an interesting you see it's called intellectual history. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, well yes. I you guess. know it is. Yes. It is. Uh, the other by the way there is one point that they also do not develop or that I have misunderstood. It's the one where they say that the the whole argument about insiders and outsiders it's has really faded away and it's unimportant. Mm, yeah. But they miss in their own collection the main point of, oh God, 
about inside history and outside really? history. <laughs> they miss it completely. Oh, really? So he, he talks about it. At the you see, they mention oh God and Alagua when it's convenient, but they don't mention them when it's inconvenient. Oh, right. <laughs> but oh God ends with this very long citation about the importance of inside, inside versus outside mm. uh, production of history. Um, well, never mind. That's not. That will not be in the future. Okay. Thank you, Jan. Yeah.